is Colin Davies. I'm a visual effects supervisor and partner at SpinVFX. And uh, as Bex mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the evolution of a visual effects pipeline. And uh, we're going to be using SpinVFX as the case study here. Uh, so for a little bit of context, uh, Spin's been around for about 25 years. We're uh, based in Toronto. And at the moment, we are uh, at around about 65 core staff, um, but we frequently scale to around 100 to deal with uh, production demands. Uh, and we're finding that we're averaging about three TV series and two films at any given time. Um, and then also to kind of help set the stage a little bit, I'm going to play a, about a three and a half minute clip of our, some of our work just to kind of give a sense of the kind of things that we are doing these days. Uh, so I'll get that going on right now. I'm just going to let it play and then I'll pick it up after. So there you go. Um, you can see that we've uh, worked on a variety of different kinds of projects, film, television, and a, a variety of different kinds of effects as well. So uh, we're doing creature work, environments, uh, simulations, that sort of thing. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to receive some recognition for that. We've got a, a managed to uh, win a few awards, uh, shared the 
primetime Emmy win for Game of Thrones season three, which is probably the highlight. Uh, some VF VES awards, some BAFTAs. Um, but to the subject at hand, um, the pipeline is a is a big subject. There's a lot uh, a lot really that goes into into that, and uh, we can't cover that all here, of course. But I mean, generally speaking, uh, we like to think of it as the people, processes, and tools by which assets and information flow through a company. We're going to really focus in more on the tools and application side of things here because we're talking about Katana, obviously. Um, and to kind of start that story, uh, I'll have to go back in time a little bit. Um, Spin started as a commercials compositing company. It was all based around Flame Suites and um, we, were, we were, had you know, three you know, rent by the hour flame suites, uh, and we're doing well with that for many years. Um, around the time that I joined Spin in 1999, um, we were very much uh, still uh, focused on the commercials. We were doing other kinds of jobs, you know, in those years, but the the pipeline we had, such as it was, was really optimized for quick turnaround. Um, fast, flexible jobs. So we were dealing with a, a, a series of general or a group of generalist artists who were good at more than one thing, and they they would informally pass files around, share information um, verbally through email. It, there wasn't a a, a a lot of structure, and that worked well in the context of doing commercials because every job is different. You're, you're constantly having to um, make updates and changes and, and adapt, and, and that type of loose structure um, made a lot of sense. Um, and we also didn't have a lot of custom tools uh, to, to worry about. We were dealing with out-of-the-box software for the most part. Uh, we were doing almost all of our CG work in Maya, rendering in Mental Ray, and then compositing in the Flame. And um, like I say, that that tool set was was uh, quite successful for us uh, and we even were able to do some smaller scale television and film jobs with that but uh, time came when we got an opportunity to uh, work on a much larger project and that is uh, Outlander which came out in 2008 but we started working on it in really 2006 but the, the bulk of the work was 2007 and this was a uh, much, much bigger job. This was 600 visual effect shots, 150 creature shots, um, and we went from a staff of about 25 to up to, oh, well, around 107 people at the peak of, uh, of Outlander. And um, we knew that we had to continue doing the commercial work at this time, um, and we were going to need to develop a, a film-ready pipeline to handle the scale of this, of, of the job and of the work, uh, and not to mention all of the people involved as well. And in looking at what we were going to need for this kind of first-generation pipeline, uh, we knew that with the creature we were working with, uh, it was going to demand a lot of displacement. We were going to need to use or have um, great motion blur. We were doing a lot of fire effects, a lot of water effects. And that was kind of a, at that time, kind of a weak spot for Mental Ray. That wasn't really their strength. So we knew we were going to need to go with a RenderMan compliant renderer. Um, we also had to formalize our internal production processes a little bit more. We developed our own in-house um, tracking soft, uh, production tracking software and instituted some checkpointing. So there was publishing. Um, you know, it was it was a, it was a more structured approach, which allowed us to handle the scale of the job, and um, w also crucially, we made our first move into node-based compositing. We went at that time; it was with Fusion. So we ended up with a, a much more linear pipeline, and this is a, of course a simplification, but you know, there's a familiar progression here, and and the, the uh, and the the real key thing here is that it was. The workflow was more based, based on departments and specialists. Uh, we had to d do that level of specialization in order to get the throughput we needed for the, for the scale of the job. And um, 
we also added a lot of uh, kind of customized tools, uh, plugins uh, for shaders, things that were, were required for uh, doing the effects work that was needed for that particular job. And that was all great. The only thing we really traded off there was the flexibility. Um, you know, there was definitely a more linear progression going on. Um, some of the kind of points to note about that first generation pipeline, we were relying very heavily on Maya referencing for scene updates, asset updates. Um, and I think crucially for us, coming from a comp background and because um, the rendering was quite expensive, we really focused on developing our looks in compositing. And there was a, a lot of uh, multi-pass rendering going on, but we weren't trying to get a, a beauty render. We were trying to get the, two, the pieces that would be required for the compositors to then assemble and, um, and, and get the final look in, in the comp. Um, and again, that tool set worked for that project. Uh, you know, we were using Maya, Maya Man, which is a plug-in to connect to Air, which was the RenderMan compliant and render, renderer that we, we could go with at that time, and, um, and then Fusion for compositing. And Outlander, when it finished, um, unfortunately did not get a very wide release. Uh, and it's actually a good movie. I suggest you go check it out. It's pretty cool. But the, for us, it, it worked as, as we'd hoped. It became our calling card. We had a lot of great work there. Uh, we took it around, showed it off a little bit, and it ended up attracting a lot of uh, work our way and opened a lot of doors for us. So in the... We, as they say, you know, we built it and they came, and, and we started to get a lot more work. Um, and in the intervening five years, um, between that first iteration of our pipeline and when we started to make the change, um, we, you know, time marches on, a, lo a lot of things did change. Um, we stopped doing commercials for one thing, um, and we had to, as demands for particular projects came up. We had to do patching, make workarounds, do the sorts of things you've got to do to get things through. And the, so the pipeline, even though its its basic underlying structure was the same, it kind of got all these additional layers on top of it that, that uh, frankly, really just served to make it all the more inflexible. Um, we switched to Nuke in 2010, and we, we started using more RenderMan in 2011. So. There, there were some changes in those five years, but they weren't drastic. And, and the, the pipeline is really beginning to show its age. We were dealing now with multiple projects. Um, uh, it wasn't just everyone focused on one thing. There was a bunch of different requirements going on. Uh, there were definitely a, a increase in the complexity of the assets we were working with and the number of, of assets in the scene files. And that led to very long load and save times. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say it was not unusual to have hour-long loads and hour-long saves on some of these big jobs. And we, we got to a point where we would actually have a separate workstation for lighters to be able to be efficient you know, with their time. So they're just waiting around for something to save. Um, the files became so large, they were very difficult to work with. And there's a kind of a natural file bloat that tends to go on as you move at, at that in that vintage of pipeline, you, you move assets through a pipeline and all, all kinds of extra nodes get accreted into these files and they become difficult to troubleshoot and, and uh, kind of unwieldy. And that leads to um, the, the, you know, not being able to make the kind of changes that you would like to make, uh, or at least not make them easily to, uh, to kind of update your assets, uh, improve your shots, improve your look, it, it became more and more difficult to do that and more and more difficult to modify the pipeline. So that kind of brought us up to spring 2012 and, and we knew it was time for a change. And um, we were very interested in uh, kind of giving ourselves the freedom to start from scratch. You know, we weren't going to be beholden to what it was we had already done. We wanted to sort of look around and see, well, what's out there? What can we, what can we do? And the three key things that we wanted to get uh, from the new pipeline was something that was very robust, fast, and flexible. And um, like I mentioned before, 
you know, the, the pipeline isn't just about the tools. Uh, we, did, we did some other things as well, very important things that I'm going to really gloss over here, but, but I have to mention them because it's a, it's a big part of it. We reorganized the structures of our departments. Uh, we hired um, key, new key staff. Uh, we abandoned the in-house production tracking software that we had authored. Uh, the development burden on that was just too much. We switched over to Shotgun. Um, we revamped a lot of our internal processes and procedures. And finally, we updated our software tools. Um, and when we it came time to look around for, well, what, what are we going to use now? Um, it just so happens that Katana was kind of a, wasn't exactly released, but it was out there as, a, as a, it was, had been announced. Um, and it's, it really did seem to fit the bill. The, the thing that really caught our attention in the beginning was just the uh, deferred loading and the fact that we could deal with these very large assets because that was a real sore point with us. Um, so we, we contacted the foundry and, and even though they weren't really actively selling to companies uh, our size at that time, they were really marketing towards much larger entities with bigger R&D teams who would be a better able to integrate something that complex into their pipeline. Um, but they felt that, you know, obviously they did want to expand into a market of, of our size company and um, the timing was just right and we ended up um, being able to work something out where they provided us with a lot of support and um, were super helpful in terms of getting us up off the ground. And of course, it coming from Imageworks and having that kind of... Uh, battle-tested, if you will, pedigree, like Nuke coming from Digital Domain, um, and the fact that the foundry had kind of proven itself as a company that could make that transition with, with the, the, that kind of software development gave us a lot of confidence in the, in the robustness of the product. Uh, I mentioned already the on-demand loading was huge for us, and the fact that it was node-based, you know, we were very familiar with node-based workflows now, uh, having worked with Nuke, and um, and, and liked the flexibility of that, and liked the fact that it's all kind of exposed in front of you and gives you kind of direct access to the renderer. And of course, having kind of m migrated towards PR Man in those intervening years, the fact that uh, Katana had native PR Man support was another plus. So uh, the pieces were really falling into place there. Um, now some highlights from, from the second generation pipeline. Um, we got to take advantage of a lot of things that had just sort of changed in the industry around that time, and Alembic was becoming widely adopted, and uh, we, we really jumped on that. Um, having the, that kind of clean break coming out of, of animation and having you know, just the, the, what you want to work with in lighting, just to have that export out and all of the other cruft that can accumulate in scene files, leave that behind, that was great. Uh, made for easy updates as well. Um, we also moved away from our focus on uh, doing so much of the heavy lifting on the look from the comp side and we pushed more of, the, of that work towards the, the, the lighting end of things. And uh, of course comp is still critical, we do tons of work in comp, but we um, were using the new plausible ray tracing in RenderMan to be able to quickly get excellent results. Um, and, and be able to do these beauty renders, you know, using HDR and proper, uh, you know, scene linear lighting um, to get that initial beauty render, but then we had all of the AOVs underneath, so we could still do what we needed to do in compositing. Um, we also really emphasized making, adhering to naming conventions easier for the artists. Uh, that seems like a, kind of a mundane thing, but it, it pays off hugely when you're trying to add automation into what it is that you're doing. And, um, and that definitely was the case in our, in our situation. Um, we had been using templates somewhat in, in Nuke, it's sort of node-based templates we'd set up for a sequence or a show. And we expanded that idea into Katana as well. And uh, I'll be showing an example of that in a few minutes. Um, and that was a huge time saver. When you're doing the same kind of thing over and over again and you can set up all of your settings, all of your uh, attributes um, once and then propagate that out, uh, it's, it's 
again, it doesn't sound that sexy, but it, it has a, a big impact. And then finally, the, the other thing that made a big uh, a positive benefit for us was the standardization on OCIO within the Foundry products um, allowed everyone to be looking at the same thing. You know, the lighters are seeing the shock grade LUTs that the compositors are seeing, and it uh, really closed the gap on um, you know, getting to, to a great final look. So that brings us to another simplified pipeline diagram, but the point I'm trying to make with this one is we were able to reintroduce a lot more flexibility into the pipeline. Uh, it wasn't such a onerous task to you know, make a, a change to an asset or whatever and, and then have force its, force its updates all the way through the pipeline. It became a lot easier to do that. And um, just the ease and, and speed of that allowed us to not only work faster, but also just get a better looking product uh, at the end of the day, because we were spending more time making things look better versus making things work. So the tool set we ended up with um, uh, also includes Mari. Uh, we do a lot of our texture, almost all of our texturing work in Mari now. Uh, we added Houdini for uh, simulation work, and of course, uh, Katana, PR Man, and Nuke. Uh, now I'm going to show just a little bit of um, Katana in action. Um, this is our asset template, and there's nothing particularly sexy about this. Uh, it's just a, a, a quick example of how we just use this day to day. So we have a shelf that we can load in a, an asset template that has all of our uh, uh, you know, basic nodes. Uh, this is a node we made that, you know, names the asset properly, sets up the paths properly. Again, just the ease of being able to do that stuff makes it possible, it just makes it happen. Um, we then load in the Alembic file that we need and the, uh, the uh, attribute file that carries the texturing information, or the texture paths from uh, the uh, texture artists, and uh, that will um, allow us to generate using a, another node in the second year, will allow us to generate a uh, networked shader for each one of those uh, tag materials. Um, so we're just going to check that we've got our asset in here. It's just a, a mid res uh, vehicle, uh, nothing special. Um, but one of the things I wanted to m just mention is the interactive render filters in Katana are super helpful. They allow you to set up, you know, um, proxy resolutions, sampling, uh, turn off expensive uh, things that you don't need to see in, a, in an interactive render, but you don't r run the risk of forgetting to turn that stuff off when it comes time to do your final render. And it seems like a small thing, but it, it's actually super helpful. So this is the, the bare bones asset. Um, we can see that we're rendering in a, in a HDR uh, lighting environment here, a consistent lighting environment. We do all our look dev for a particular set of assets in, uh, in one place so that it carries over. Just loaded a uh, material tags file that uh, we have a node that will take that tags file and then automatically generate all of the uh, materials, uh, network materials within Katana uh, to and, and using primvars, the textures automatically link up to our default shaders that we have uh, created here, and um, it just it r removes a lot of busy work, a lot of file browsing to hook everything up. Um, and here uh, we're just taking a, a generic shader and turning it into glass or chrome or whatever. Um, and one of the things that we can do, you know, because this is, is very much uh, uh, an in-progress pipeline still, I think they, they all are, frankly, um, you know, we can add material libraries here. So we would have glass and chrome and vinyl and all the various materials. We could, we could add that in as part of a, the step to uh, get us one step closer to, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a final look without having to go in and modify the default materials. And that's, you know, that's on our list. Um, and then in a second here, we're going to look at uh, another thing that I, another like little thing, but uh, 
super helpful in my mind. It's the pixel analyzer um, is ability to go in and pick an object from the image rendered and just load that, open that object up. Um, so you, you don't, if you want to kind of work on something here, I'm going to be um, creating an ID uh, for the ID pass that we generate in, our, in all of our assets. Um, you know, I'm doing it manually in this case, but instead of unpacking the entire asset and you know, rotating around and trying to find the piece that I want, I just pick it in the image and, and, uh, and up it comes, and it just makes for a much more interactive workflow. So, I mean, you can automatically generate these IDs uh, based on material names and things like that, but um, I'm doing it manually here. Um, and the idea is we would have consistent IDs, consistent tech passes, uh, f for every asset so that, and every update of that asset so that when things change, again, it doesn't break when it gets to comp. Um, here you can see the uh, embedded AOVs uh, and the viewer allows you to kind of go through and see all of those things. We use that constantly. Um, here in this example, the difference between the indirect spec and the specular is not significant, so you're not really seeing much there. but. Um, uh, it, it's a, a huge uh, benefit to be able to view the, your AOVs uh, in action there. Um, so here we have a, you know, a good start on a, on a mid-res asset uh, and it went pretty quick. Uh, we have a turntable set up already as part of the, uh, the template, so it'll automatically ran, uh, run a certain frame range. Um, the lights will rotate, the camera rotates, um, and it's, it's just, again, little time savers. Uh, and then ultimately we write out a look file, which is the compressed recipe that uh, Katana uses to um, allow you to take all of the decisions that you made in this node graph, and w when you want to propagate that out to a shot, you're just loading a single file, you're not loading a huge tree. and if you, but if you need to, you can go into that look file and go in and make modifications and, and make further adjustments. So that is that. Uh, I'd kind of summarize um, the big benefits that Katana's brought to us as being the flexibility and speed. And that is best, I think, illustrated by my little graph here at the end. I went and I was curious myself. I knew we'd been doing things faster, but um, I checked the shot throughput starting in 2012 when we, when we switched over to Shotgun. Um, and 2012 was the last year that we were using the older pipeline. Uh, we did, with 85 artists at peak, we did uh, 716 shots. The next year when we had started the rollout and we were kind of halfway through uh, making the changes, um, at 90 staff we did 1,255 shots. And this year, so far, with 99 hours, we've done 2,262 shots. So, I mean, there's obviously a lot of other factors go into that, but um, that, that's a pretty powerful, um, and it's certainly our impression internally is that, that there has been a huge speed up. So we're super happy about that, um, and we hope there are many other things we can do, automated scene builds, uh, scene updates, things like that, but we'll hopefully we'll keep that graph growing in that direction. Um, and I guess I'd just like to finish by thanking the crew at Spin who built this pipeline and use it every day to, uh, to make such great work. Uh, they're a great group of people, and uh, I'm uh, proud to, to work with them. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. That was fantastic. I'm, uh, I have to just geek out for a moment because I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. Okay. But I have to say, I have mixed feelings about the fact that now, in some small part, I was responsible for the Red Wedding. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I how I feel about that. I know, I know. It was, it was tough to keep that one under our hats because uh, <laughs> for anyone who hadn't read the book, of course, it was a huge shocker. Yes, yeah. And, uh, it, was, yeah it was fun. So um, I, I'm curious. You mentioned the load and save times that were yeah. upwards of an hour, and that's pretty horrendous. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you experience now when you're, when you're passing assets through oh, Katana? It's seconds. Yeah. I mean, because you're just loading a script. You're just loading just the, the nodes of the script, right. so you, you only incur the, the penalty of, of the size of your geometry if you unpack your hierarchy, and oftentimes when you're lighting, you don't need to do that. I mean, you, 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 it just loads what it needs when it renders it, and if you need to go in and find something to modify it, you do what you know, I showed there, where you use the pixel analyzer and just go get the thing you want mm -hmm. in your image. 
And so from the uh, initial, when you guys decided to go with Katana and, and we brought it in-house, what was the duration of installation, integration, before you were actually working on it uh, on, a, on an actual project? Um, let's see. I would say we had it in summer of 2012, and we used it, I think the first shot we really used it on in production was uh, in All is Lost. We had a, a rollover, boat rollover shot, which didn't have to be Katana, but it was just there. Mm -hmm. It was time to do something, and we did it. And uh, so that was end of that year, uh, probably like November of that year, so it was a couple of months. And what, in, in, at Spin, which, uh, sort of which arm of, of artists were the first to come, were the, were the lighters or TDs, or who was the first to really embrace Katana? It was the lighters. The lighters. The and lighters. was moving into the, you know, a, a node graph workflow, was that, were they already familiar with that from Nuke, or was that a bit of a, a change for them? They were pretty familiar with it. Our lighters do a lot of pre-comping and, and, and did, just based on the old way we used to work, where we would just have these kind of raw passes and then build a look in the, in the comp, they were pretty familiar with Nuke. So it, it, I think that was part of what made the adoption uh, so much easier for them. Uh, they really appreciated that kind right. of flexibility. And you mentioned that uh, once you had Katana in and the Katana RenderMan uh, pipeline working, it really changed the way you do composite. And I'm assuming what you mean there is that you used to have to break complex shots into elements render those out and then reassemble in comp and now you're doing more things in camera, is that the idea? Yeah, exactly. And we, we, we spend uh, a little bit more time now, well actually, you know, not even more time, I would, I would say that's not accurate. We, we're, we're quickly able to get, using the plausible ray, ray tracing, very good looking um, beauty renders, contrasting the old way we used to do it where, you know, we would um, render separate light passes, uh, we would render separate ambient occlusions, we would render all of these things kind of separately, and you wouldn't really get to see what it looked like until you put it into the comp. And, uh, and you know, you would, you would still get the flexibility, and you could still get there, but it just wasn't quick. Yeah, I would assume that you get to a more realistic look actually faster, right? Very much so. You probably would end up with, you know, when you've got every element rendered separately, and then you have to reassemble it, and then the, the lighting doesn't match, and you're then color grading each element, that, Exactly. And then there's a the subjective uh, analysis there as well. So. Yeah, pr very right. much. Well, thank you very much. Do we have? Okay. All right. What's up for the next version of the pipeline? Ah, is there? Just, so that's a good one. Is there anything? You, your your pipeline is evolving. Is there anything now? Any pain sure. points that you would like to evolve further, other than replacing Maya with Moto, which is <laughs> an obvious right. thing you'd probably want to do. Right. Actually, a number of our artists, um, I think, on their own, are just Moto users, especially the younger ones, and it, it has come up. But uh, the, I think for the next generation, what we want to do is more. Um, focus on scene build and scene update. I mean, right now you saw in that little demo I did there, I was kind of browsing for the uh, ABC files and the attribute files and things like that. I mean, it's actually quite easy in Katana to do a scene build. The work is really more on, on the uh, production tracking end of things, the database side of things um, outside of Katana, get that worked out so that we can efficiently, smartly build scenes and then update scenes. I think we'd say that's the, the number one one. And then secondarily to that, the little things like, you know, I mentioned the material library. Um, you know, it's something that we've kind of been working on, but it, it, the, we have, just haven't had the dedicated time to sit, sit down and go, okay, well, this is copper and this is iron and this is all the various things that, you know, could save us a bit of time. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, Enjoyed it. Pleasure. Fantastic work. Thank you.